No rush. All right, no worries. Go. Hello. Look hey, at your hat. You? <laughs> Dobson, how's it going? Good. How are you guys doing? <laughs> good. We're doing so good. Love your look today. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you right now? Uh, I'm in Nashville. Very nice. Do you oh, live nice. there, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you like it? Do you miss Canada? Um, I, I mean, I love Toronto, you know? Uh, yeah. I don't miss the weather right now. Oh, hell no. Hell no. Um, <laughs> so I'm enjoying this time here and, yeah. you know, before I go back out there to work to Toronto. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I, yeah. Yeah. We're so stoked to hear. We're so excited to talk to you. We're like massive fans. We're not even going to pretend to not fangirl. Like we absolutely love you. We've loved you since day one. And just so you know, like what you're getting yourself into here, our podcast is called Girl on Girl. I'm Sarah. Mm -hmm. I identify as straight. That's Chrissy. She's my best friend. She identifies as gay. So mm -hmm. the whole point of this podcast is we just try to facilitate conversations between straight people and queer people. We talk about gender, sexuality, a queerness and we just try to bridge that gap with like awesome. compassion and just understanding each other and we talk to a whole bunch of different guests about all sorts of different topics but we're so excited to talk to you because we haven't talked to as a queer icon yet in the music industry like you and we're excited to talk to you about like why you think that is we have some ideas we've talked about it many times but um yeah that's essentially what we're all about but just to start out, I mean, you don't need any introduction. Usually we ask for a guest, like, tell us about yourself, but everyone knows Fifi, Fifi Dobson. Um, <laughs> from, from the top, like, you probably get this question a lot, but how did you even start songwriting? What was like, do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Uh, yeah, well, kind of. I actually had like a little, I was obsessed with Hanson growing up. And oh, yeah. um, so I started like a little trio. Uh, in elementary school, and we tried to write songs about playgrounds and um, <laughs> Venus flytrap. I don't know why I wrote about that too. <laughs> it's, she was okay. she was a lot older than me, like a little bit older than me. The the main singer, well, the main writer with me, and she was writing about Venus flytrap. I have no idea. Uh, and um, we yeah, so we started this little band, and then after that, I kind of just got into poetry. And then I actually wrote for a local boy band that I had heard about through Speaker's Corner. And um, I was at home, I was like 14, and I wrote them and I was like, I'll write you guys a song. So I wrote this song called Baby It's You, inspired by yes. NSYNC, of course. <laughs> yeah, and, um, of course. Of course, and then they sang it and recorded it and everything. So I've always kind of dabbled into writing since I was young. Yeah, and so they recorded that song. When, yeah. when they did, were you, were you surprised? Were you like, oh shit, I could maybe do this? Well, yeah. I mean, I was literally in elementary school. Um, I hadn't even got to high school yet. And, wow. or I might've just gotten to high school. I don't remember. Everything's a blur at this point. Amen. <laughs> uh, Amen. Amen. Anyway, I was really young. I was like 13, 14. And I guess that's grade nine. I'm not sure. But anyway, they came to my house and um, I was so stoked because I had boys in my room for the first time. And that <laughs> That's was like awesome. the dream, like 14 yeah, year old awesome. you. Yeah. And they were like 18 and I was like, I have the song Ooh. and I slipped it to them and then they sang it and they recorded it. And I think they got some like love from the industry. Like, you know, they were, they were trying to get signed basically. Right. And uh, one of the members actually turned out to be uh, one of the members that, I don't know if you guys remember the band ID, the boy band ID. They came out for a split second. Yes, uh, I do. In, in Toronto. And yes. um, one of the members actually was from that original uh, Speaker's Corner reach out. So No way. Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Have you ever felt cooler than that moment when they were in your room and you were passing them a song they were going to love and record? Um, yeah, I felt pretty cool, but I also was like, when I look back, I had like NSYNC posters everywhere and like Britney <laughs> and like, I had like the marionettes hanging and they were probably just like, who is this little girl? But you're like, listen, yeah. here's a song. So yeah, there we listen, go. Okay. <laughs> listen, I'm about to make you a star. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Who were your inspirations growing up? Uh, they were all over the map, you know, from uh, Judy Garland, because I'm a big theater um, person. I love music theater, um, mm -hmm. to Kurt Cobain, to 
uh, Lisa Lisa, Nicole Jam, and Janet Jackson. Um, yeah. it, it goes, it goes all over the place. Bee Gees, everyone, uh, Lionel Richie. I love them all for different reasons. So I grew up on a lot of music. I was submerged in a lot of different genres. Yeah, I feel like that reflected in your music too. Yeah, I, I mean, I was very fortunate that way. The only uh, band I never got introduced to, which was very weird, and I asked my mom about this, and I was very stressed out about it, actually. <laughs> uh, she never played a Beatles record. And no way. Yeah, I didn't get to, like, really learn about the Beatles. I had my first Beatles CD until I was, like, 16. Um, she was like, oh. it reminds me of my mom. And I was like, it reminds you of grandma? Okay, well, thanks for not getting me into the Beatles like <laughs> so now I'm a, I'm a huge Beatles fan but like yeah I, I did not get that from my mom which was very unfortunate the one thing she dropped the ball on the I know Beatles. right <laughs> I know that's amazing and then how old were you when take me away dropped were you 15 uh when take me away or well bye bye boyfriend kind of was first but it was just Canadian single yeah um and I was I think 17 18 but take me away was right after that so I was about 18 right oh, cool yeah. yeah when we released a single and all that stuff did you know either for bye bye boyfriend or take me away when you were writing it slash releasing it did you have an idea it might hit like was that in your in your plan or were you did you not think that it would hit the way it did with take me away yeah uh well it was actually the, like, one of the last songs we added to the album and it was because we needed we needed a single we had a lot of artsy tracks and yeah. fun tracks and stuff like that and deep deep records but we didn't have that single so i went back into the studio in new york i think it was um and we wrote it out there oh no we wrote it in toronto and then brought it to new york to record mm -hmm. but it was uh it was just a, it was just an add-on really that's funny you wrote it for the purpose of being a single and yeah, then it, and yeah. then it hit so hard like was there was there like a story behind the song or was it more like we're it we're writing this because we need a hit we knew we had to do something upbeat um but it was written about because again my obsession with NSYNC but Justin Timberlake was like my big obsession and so uh mm -hmm. take me away is about him and it about Justin at that point. I mean, the blue eyes Stop. and like- love that. Yeah, yeah, it was all about like <laughs> I, manifesting. <laughs> it was all about manifesting him and like, it like talks about kind of like, yeah, it talks about like the posters on my wall kind of in a slight way and- um, Yeah. And so, yeah, and so, um, which was funny because the song's called Take Me Away and then he ended up taking me on tour. That was my first European tour. So he did take me away to, to Europe. Uh, so manifesting is real. <laughs> that yeah, if no one believes manifesting is real, like prime example, you literally wrote a song about JT and you were opening for him on tour. That's yeah, incredible. Yeah, I kind of kept it to myself for years that it was about him because I didn't want to seem like the stalker girl. But now I don't care. <laughs> no, it's like whatever. Now, now you just have to say it exactly. Yeah, now I'm a stalker girl. It's all good. That is amazing. I did not know that. If I were Justin, I'd be so honored. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. I'm gonna look back at the lyrics now and be like, oh yes. Now I can like Yeah, it was like, it like a 17, 18 year old just being very like obsessive, like boy crazy. And it's so it's yeah. so specific. To, like it talking about looking to his eyes ocean blue and all this. It's very yes. specific. Oh my I god. <laughs> what was that tour like? Was that your first big tour? Yeah, it was my first really big tour. I mean, I had done radio shows, and back in the day, radio shows were really big. Like, you would have people in this, like, you would have from Lenny Kravitz, Janet Jackson, Pharrell, me, you know yeah. what I mean? It was like, back in the day, radio shows were insane. Yeah. Um, stadium shows, you know? Um, but that was my really first, like, that was my big first like, opener tour with a really big headliner. So, yeah, it was pretty magical. Was it intimidating or were you like, okay. Oh, extremely intimidating at first because we pulled in with this little van and he had like 99 trucks or something like that. So we pull in <laughs> like backstage and like the whole, you know, stadiums open up and stuff like that. And um, we were like, <laughs> we're like, where are we? It was like the Wizard of Oz. It was crazy. 
everything was in color all of a sudden and meeting him was was crazy it was just one of those you know i had to be like really, you know really like yeah, nice to meet you, man. Cool. Yeah, like, hey, what's you up? Know, I try to be all tough. Like, what up, sure. dude? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to whoop your ass on stage. I know who you are. <laughs> um, but yeah. then after he left, it was always like, oh, my God. Yeah, that's like, when you just, like, so... let the emotions release. And you're like, okay, yeah. I can breathe. Now. Yeah, yeah. Um, last question about this. Did you ever tell him the song was about him? Do you think he knows? Oh, no, I've never, I've never told him. <laughs> I wonder if he had an idea. I bet not. You'd have to be pretty narcissistic to be like, that's, yeah. that's like, about me. me. <laughs> that's about me. Every song is about me. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's maybe somewhere down the line, it'll come, come out through pop culture and it'll be like, yeah, you know, but maybe he'll listen to this podcast. You know, JT is a big fan. We're manifesting it, Sarah. There we go. I'm going to write it down this. in my journal. It's happening. <laughs> I love it. Fifi, for for real, like Sarah and I were just talking about this, that you were an absolute trailblazer during that time and coming out in like pop punk music. Did you know that like being a black woman in that genre would set you apart from your peers and who was also there around that time? Um, I didn't really think about it, honestly, when I did it. it. It's all like the genre that I chose to do was because that's that's the one that made sense to me. That's the only thing that spoke to me. You know, I needed to feel like a rebel in my music. I had to express what I was going through as a teenager and my childhood and and that's the genre that made the most sense to how I was feeling. Never really thought about it. Mm-hmm. I maybe I was kind of blind to it or very protected, but at, at the beginning I was just like I me, you know, like yeah, I had insecurities and I, you know, I grew up in Scarborough and I, and you know, my, my mom's white, my dad's black and I, I never saw color, you know? And so for me, it was just like, yeah, my hair is really curly. I know I'm not like, I don't look like Avril. I don't look like that, but like, I'm doing pretty good, you know? Yeah. Hell yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So I didn't really think about it until I was out until my music came out and I was um, actually put out into the world. And then when I started to hear things and people questioning my color, doing the genre I was doing and stuff like that, I really broke my heart because I went in really kind of innocent in it and just wanted to make music and do my dream. Right. Yeah. That makes sense that your whole focus would just be the music because that's what you're there for. And that's like, you know, yeah. Your love yeah, music for me right. was my survival. Like I didn't, I didn't look at it as like, oh, I want to be famous or I want to do this or I want to do that. I was like, this is all I know since right. I've been a little girl and I don't see anything else. So yeah. So once it, I was kind of like put into the, the world of like criticism and like questioning and it was definitely hard. You did this amazing interview with the Finery 29 last summer. If anyone listening hasn't read it yet, you have to go read it. It was written by Kathleen Newman Bramang. I think I'm pronouncing her name right. And I just want to read this quote back to you because it's so good, this quote. Like, this is exactly how I felt when I first when I first saw the video for Take Me Away. This is how I felt as a white girl growing up in suburban Southern Ontario. But she said, her presence in the pop landscape felt like permission to be Black and angry in public. Dobson's singularity gave unspoken approval to millennial Black girls to just be whatever they may look like. I call them Dobson descendants. <laughs> which I'm obsessed awesome. with that. Um, <laughs> awkward, awesome. awkward, angsty black girls who were quirky before it was cool and who saw Dobson's popularity as a ticket to the freedom of self-expression. And like I said, white girl growing up in Southern Ontario, I really related to this immediately because you gave me permission to be angry. And yeah. that that's what the whole, that whole era felt like for me and most of my friends was like, as young girls, we're allowed to be angry and we're allowed to be angry in public. But I think it takes on a whole different layer when right. when you're a woman of color and you're seeing a woman of color who doesn't look like Avril, who doesn't look like Linkin Park, for example, right. and they're just as angry, if not even more angry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like Purse has talked about this, like she had that feeling too, as being one of the only brown girls in her entire community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, growing up in Whitby, Ontario, for sure. When oh, I wow, saw yeah. you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, girl, I know, trust me. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, in my high school, all the grade twelves at one point when we were doing like yearbook photos, all the brown girls like took a photo together because I think there was only like 
six or seven of us and we're just like, okay, wow. here we are. But um, I definitely uh, could see myself in you and your music and was like a huge, huge fan, still am a huge fan, but I really appreciated that, like seeing that representation because we talk about this on the pod all the time, like representation in the media really does matter. 100%. So, yeah. um, and, and also to touch on that too, is like to be angry, right? But also to like, just be honest and, you know, honesty is so important. And I feel like in that time period with music it was very honest, which is very important. And for females to be able to like, not have to show every inch of their body in order to, you know, and when you're young. And when we were young, there was a beautiful innocence about our time, you know? We were still wearing, you know, Converse and getting dirty and running around and beating up on boys and, you know, and like be with your girl and just be like, you know, like there's a lot of that missing now with young people more young females, I think, in some ways. So I think that we stood for a lot in that time period. Yeah, yeah. not just the permission to be angry or honest, but just the permission to be young and yeah. like, you know what I mean? The and permission to be young is so real. Yeah. So real. And it's missing nowadays, I definitely think, right? Like even just yeah. seeing how the generation is now compared to us when we were like 13. It's wild. Right, right. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of like a little teeter tottering on bad here and there on on the generation right now with young females i feel like they have a lot of pressure and you know i think that maybe yes we had pressure of course we did but we only had it in front of our faces you know mm -hmm. and around us we didn't have to deal with the you know for me like the social media aspect of like someone in a completely different country judging me at 15 years old Totally. You know, there's, there's another level at this point with that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even back then, like you said earlier, you, you went into it just, you know, the, it was for the music and then you yeah. were kind of, you were kind of hit with the reality of like, okay, people have opinions now. Yeah. And even like, when you were just starting out, you were going to sign a record deal. And then we read that some record exec, execs wanted to try and like rebrand you a bit. And they tried to dub you like Brandy Spears or something like that. And yeah. you basically, you turned it down and you went your own way because you had a vision for yourself. Yeah. Um, and like you, you must've been so young. Like what gave you that kind of confidence, especially when you're going into it so innocently, like we're talking about, like you're, you're probably still in those like converse kind of days. Yeah. And then you're coming into it innocently and hitting this wall of like, oh shit, the industry is going to try and make me something I'm not. Like what gave you that confidence? Yeah, it was definitely hard to turn down in some sense because it's like you never know if you're going to get another um, chance and yeah. when you're young. And But I just was kind of maybe had an ego. I, I don't know. I was just like, whatever. It's, you know, there's going to be another option. But I also, um, something I've always gone with my gut. I've always gone with my heart, even when it's, I don't know, maybe not always the best. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm kind of that way. So something in my heart just told me that it wasn't right. I just didn't want to do um, any other genre than pop rock. And they mm -hmm. wanted to do something different. Um, but yeah, it was a great opportunity for me to help support my family, my mom, and she's a single mother, you know, single parent. And I knew I could help her with like a, you know, an advance and, yeah. but I just couldn't do it. And I, I, was, I was fortunate, like I said, I had a great uh, production team with me at that point that was wanting me to like, push through and like that's we wrote stupid little love songs kind of like the first one and they were like this is you like don't you see this and I was like yes I was like finally so I really yes. trusted my production team and I trusted where they were directing me and to my management a manager and management um Chris Smith and and I felt like I was really being pushed in the right um direction so it was a little a lot easier to say like bye to the other people yeah, yeah. Because you had that cool. support and I, most importantly, you were staying authentic to you, so. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> man, man, man and merger, I said. Man, merger. <laughs> man, merger. Words, words, what are those? Same, uh, same. We know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, I'm happy that you had a group around you. I was going to ask you that because, I mean, you're so young. You're still trying to get your foot in the door 
it helps to have a full team of people being like, this is where you need to go and this is how. Oh yeah, for sure. I lost your ego. Yeah. I feel like, you know, it's like a formula. It's like PP's ego plus a great support system equals right. the right I, It's direction. either an ego or I was absolutely out of my mind at a young age and I was just <laughs> in, absolutely insane. You we know, all were a little. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that too. Yeah. Being a little crazy. You have to be a little nuts to be in this industry, honestly. It's a really crazy industry. Even to think like one day, like, you know what? I want to get signed by a record deal. And I'm going to have albums in the world. Like, it's so, you have to be a little like, like, okay, all right, sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know? right. I agree. I agree. I think it takes a certain type of person. You have to, you have to be kind of fearless. Yes, for sure. Or you, you have to have fears and just be okay with completely ignoring them. Yeah. Or working with them somehow. I don't know. Work, um, totally. Fears are interesting. <laughs> um, we want to talk to you about, um, your like place in the queer community, but we have to ask you first about the joy era because it was absolutely epic. And you you kind of had like a little bit of a hiatus. You went away for a little. And then it felt like the joy era was like a, almost like a comeback. Cause I just, I remember like hearing you for the first time, I think it must've been 10. And then when joy came out, I was in high school. And I remember just like going to my best friend and being like, Fifi's fucking back. Fifi is back <laughs> and it's back and it's about to blow up and then stuttering ghost like what I could imagine it's hard after a little bit of a hiatus to act that strong was, was there something like fueled you coming back uh for some reason I always take like four or five years off I don't even do it purposely it's like yeah. um well you know we did the first album with take me away and, and the song everything and whatnot and then um Sunday Love, we, we, we worked on that and that didn't get released. So then it was like starting all over again. That took a good five, six years before, I think five right. years or so before um, I Want You and Watch Me Move came out. And that was kind of like just an introduction single. Like that was just like, okay, let's just show yeah. people we're out and, and we're, we're, we're playing around with the industry again and we're here. And then um, I went to LA and, and ghost and stuttering and all that stuff happened. So it was, uh, it's just the way it, it seems to work with me. I don't know why. Yeah. Even with this one, it's like, since then, it was like 2012. And then we released Legacy and In Better Hands. And then we went quiet again. So there were a lot of different, mm -hmm. there's a lot of logistics that happened too. And I was kind of in like, um limbo we're trying to figure out some stuff and but yeah we're about to release a new single in a couple of weeks and and new album so exciting couple weeks yeah new single oh my god weeks. okay hold on we were going to ask you about this at the end but can you just give us a little bit like what's what's coming up can you give us any spoilers or teasers well we shot a video so that's done and um okay. and the single is called i don't know if i'm allowed to swear in here on your podcast yeah, but it's all the time. called it's called fucking in love so love yes! it yes and i'm so stoked is there like a full album coming after okay yeah oh it, my it, god we're uh we're working on it and finishing off but we wanted to release a single first and try, kind of just be like hey what's up guys i'm back totally. <laughs> for sure yes. for sure a little reintroduction yeah. if you will yeah yes mm -hmm. okay I, I am so excited to hear it wow Me too. wow wow Let's talk about you as a queer icon a little bit because um, we're kind of curious just off the top, like, was there a point where you realized or figured out that your music was becoming important in the queer community? Like, do you remember having that realization? Like, oh, hold on. I think I might be, I might have a place there or they might like me over there. Uh, for me, I've always felt very comfortable with my sexuality and, and m my friends and the people around me, um, bi or straight or gay, um, that's been my world, you know? Um, that's just natural for me um, since I've been young. Uh, yeah. But I don't think I really realized the impact since, like from all, everything I've done till Drag Race. Love that. that just happened. So yeah. Yeah. for me, it really, really touched me. Like I'm very, very deeply in um, those tears on that show were 100% very real. 
because I realized the impact of that very moment. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Have you ever seen um, one of your songs being performed in drag live? Go. Like, like other than, was it other than the show? Um, actually, I had a, now that, that, that's, that's actually it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. I, I'm trying to remember if Beatrice did it for me, if she did it for me, um, performed it. There's a drag show in um, the Florida Keys and uh, I just recently met Beatrice and she's amazing and she's one of the headliners there. And I don't remember if she performed Ghost or she, you know, she introduced me to the crowd and was very stoked and um, we've kept in touch. But yes. yeah, I think, I think Drag Race was one of the first moments for me to really be like oh my goodness like this is this is real and yeah and it really really moved me why do you think like why do you think the queer community and the drag community like embraced you and your music so much like what do you think what do you think it was about you we have some theories but we'd love to see what you think i would love to hear your theories actually i i mean i think I, for me i i just make my music and try to be as fabulous as i can and try to be as uh, honest in which we talked about earlier, and yeah, um, and I, I and unapologetic for yes. who I am and what I am and how I look. Um, and I'm, you know, I've always been one to like if there was a lineup and there was a bunch of people, I'm not going to follow them. You know, I'm going to start my own, and that's how I've always been. I've since I was young, you know. So yeah. Good or bad, <laughs> that's just who I am. <laughs> I personally, I mean, personally, you can speak to this too, being the queer yeah. one in this in this uh, dichotomy. But I would say that's exactly how I feel in terms of like why the queer community embraces Fifi so much. We've talked about this before with some of our guests, but the reason why like pop icons seem even whether they're queer or not seem to come into the queer zeitgeist is because queer people have to suppress their emotions for so long. Like mm -hmm. for so, it's different for everyone, but it's like a large amount of time. You're suppressing your emotions. Maybe you're being someone who you're not pretending, you know, it's all suppressed. Right. And right. then the people who, icons who are theatrical, emotional with their music and with their singing, not afraid to be angry, dramatic. I'm using air quotes, guys. Right. Real estate. Um, like that is something that, the, that queer people like latch on to because right. it's like, I don't have to suppress anymore. I can express because this person's giving me permission to express. And that's, that. you know, all the way from like Brittany to Mariah to Love Freddie. Me some Mariah. Fre oh yes. God, don't even get Queen. Like, started. <laughs> can't. But dramatic but like, was a, a very important one. And I, I, I would definitely say that there's a lot of like for me on stage i'm all about drama so yeah and not oh, purposely, yeah. it's just the way i am yeah, yeah. And I, think, I love that you said unapologetic like i i think that along with dramatic is key um because queer people have to apologize all the time for who they are mm -hmm. um in so many different scenarios mm -hmm. and so being able to like come into contact with music a persona a person who doesn't apologize for who they are just puts it out there i mean that's really yeah. powerful that's yeah. that's why I feel like the queer community is in love with you. That's yeah. Amazing. And like to like piggyback that. off of that, it's exactly that. Like just being you, being authentic and like the theatrics behind it all is why like I resonated with you specifically for sure. And being a woman of color. That was really important for me. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> And then back to drag really quick. So we already talked about it, but just in case anyone hasn't seen um, Canada's Drag Race, Fifi was a guest judge on the show. And just the idea of your music being done in drag in general, what do you feel that's taught you about the impact of your music or the impact of your artistry? Oh, it's <laughs> hard to put into words, honestly. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to put into words. It's more than a, than a, than a word. It's, it's a deep soul feeling. And it's, I mean, you, like, again, it comes out. I could not stop myself on the show <laughs> from it, it, it. And it was like, 
I was about to ugly cry. I was ugly crying. It was like so, <laughs> it was so deep that I, you know, like some tears fall and you go, okay, my tears have fallen. But when you literally can't breathe. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I can't I, control myself. <laughs> I can't control myself and I'm just going to let it all hang out. That's, that's how I felt. That's, mm-hmm. those are the words I cannot express. Yeah. yeah. It's ineffable. Yeah. Ineffable. Love that word. I love that word. Yeah. <laughs> love that it's word. the word, the word for when you don't have words. It's ineffable. There we go. That's beautiful. And your song, Don't Go, Girls and Boys. That's a queer like anthem. An, yeah. It's like an underrated queer anthem. And I mean, mostly because of the chorus, right? The, just like the lyrics being like clearly pointing to queer relationships. What were you like mindful of that when you were writing the song? Was there something that inspired you to write that into the lyrics? I've been asked this question and the honest, I just wrote, I didn't even think about it. Um, with that one, I, I wasn't even trying to do it purposely. It was what came out of me naturally. And, um, that's how I felt. And you know, when I was a little girl, I never wore a dress till I was, you know, in my early 20s. I was a tomboy. I, there was a moment in, when I was young where I was like, do I like girls? Do I like boys? You know, I, you know, so for me, it felt very comfortable to, to say that because that's what I felt. That's what mm-hmm. I believed. That's yeah. interesting. When, when you were, ha- I had that um, moment too in my in my growing up experience, do I like girls and do I like boys? And Purse, yeah. you have obviously had like many of those moments in your in your adolescence. Many, many, many. Many a moment. <laughs> many a moment. <laughs> but when you were going through that moment that I think most people go through, um, mm. were how did you feel? Were you completely open to figuring it out? Were you kind of suppressing, scared of that question? You know what I mean? Like, were there queer people around you in your community or in your family? Um, no, I didn't have anyone around me in my family, but, um, I had music and I could relate to like David Bowie, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. when he said, not sure if I'm a boy or a girl, um, in one of his songs and like stuff like that. So I, I turned to that, you know, right. but it's just, it's just always been in my life naturally. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean, yeah. It's just very natural for me to uh, yeah. to write like that and to 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 be there and su- be supportive. Definitely. And also having that like in the lyrics just so like out there is just what's needed, right? Like there does need to be, I think, like more songs out there speaking about queer relationships. Like we're definitely getting there now, like compared mm-hmm. to years and years ago, but I still think there needs to be more and um, the more people see that, like young queers can hear that and be like, okay, like that's, that's okay if I feel that way, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And when Don't Go Girls and Boys came out, it honestly, there were no songs about queer relationships, at least not explicitly. Not explicitly, yeah. no. Wow. So yeah, I, I feel like it might've been an even that's bigger wild. moment than you realize. Yeah. The queer community it's was big. like, whoa. Fifi is saying something. She is saying something. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I am listening. That's amazing. I got to start performing that one again. Please do. Rap show. Yes. Yeah, add it, add it to your next tour, please. We I request. We're we'll be in the front row. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Purse, do you have any more questions about queerness? Yeah. Fifi being a queer icon? Well, like, I was just about to ask you, like, we've mentioned you are a queer icon, and, like, we hope you know that, but how do you feel when people say that to you? Like, how do you respond to the word icon? Because we just want to make sure you, you absolutely know um, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're like, okay. I get, like, stoked. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's amazing, you know, like, Again, it's the, it's like, what do you say? You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's very humbling. It's very, um, all I can say is thank you, you know? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank and I you. mean, like bringing it back to this, like me being 
gay now, but when I was growing up in high school and struggling with my sexuality, like so many ups and downs and being one of the only brown girls in that community, I didn't really see much representation. So like, I just want to thank you for being that person for me to kind of be like, it's okay to be you and you standing out in your genre as well. And actually I was telling Sarah this right before we were going to interview you. But when I was in high school, like my friends would like call me Fifi Dobson in a way, like oh. it, truly like, and I, I even that. got, it was, it was hilarious. I was like, yeah, they did. I got like the front bangs in 2014. And I was like, <laughs> I truly am channeling stuttering right now. Ghost. I love that. Like, it's, it's happening. I love that. That makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, hey, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to hear the new music. And maybe we can get you guys a little special sneak peek or something so you guys can hear it. That would That'd be, be insane. amazing. We would love that with our whole hearts. And by the time this episode airs, it'll probably, like, the release day will probably be announced and everything. Yeah. Um, but is, like, is there anything else before we say goodbye that you want to say about the new music? Anything you want to, like, plug a little bit? Uh, I, it's really just about this first single right now called Fucking In Love. And uh, it's coming around Valentine's Day. So, you know, Makes you sense. can definitely sing it to somebody that Ooh. you might fucking love. Um, <laughs> That's a great title, by the way. Great title. Thank it you. Is. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm really excited. I'm just, I'm just excited to get, you know, music out there and, and just show people what I've been up to and what I've been working on and the sound and I'm stoked. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. We're so, so are we. We're so excited. We're so excited. We're so grateful that you came and talked to us and took your time. We know you're so busy, but we appreciate you. The queer community appreciates you so much. And um like has so much love for you and throughout the years have like seen themselves so much in you so thank you for just thank being you. you always being thank you, you guys. yeah I thank really you appreciate it i really appreciate it a lot thank you of course of course, of course. i'm so in love with you